Hi, I'm Pastor Steve with Screaming Rock Ministries, presenting Faith and Hope for Today. Genesis is the beginning of the recorded history of humanity and reveals that God has a plan, has always been there for us, has already defeated evil. Will you join us for a thought-provoking journey to the solutions of life's complexities? Welcome back. We are really glad to be with you again today. Uh, We are into that really beautiful time of year into September. And uh, what a great, I'm sorry, my apologies, October. And uh, we have some fascinating conversations. Uh, You do not want to miss this particular presentation because I believe it deals with many of our relevant issues in our world today. Even though we are in Genesis looking at chapter 19. So I hope you're blessed. Uh, I'd like to just take a moment and uh, tour with you to the top of a ridge in which uh, I guess we'll call this Mr. Grumpy Rock, uh, one of those really unique formations that we have here in Oregon and Idaho. Uh, I hope you enjoy that, Sherry. That was a lovely picture, so thank you very much for that, and I hope you enjoy that as well. So we've got a lot to talk about. Faith and hope for today presents Genesis, the beginning of everything. Our title, subtitle actually, is God's judgment. Now, judgment means many things to many people. It doesn't matter whether you believe in God or in karma, whatever, this concept of judgment. So we are going to explore a story that can sometimes be perplexing. It deals entirely with the judgment of God. And I hope you learned some new terms today. So bear with us as we jump in. Uh, Our first slide says, God's divine judgment in response to sin. Now in this story, we learn how God sees sexual violence and abuse. I want to introduce you to a unique phrase called corporate punishment. Now, corporate punishment unfolds in the story in a very unique way. And corporate means, in this case, everyone that is involved in the story is going to be able to either avoid the punishment or to experience it. Now, judgment gets really complicated when you talk about, you know, what about innocent people? And the question is, are there really such things as innocent people? So as we delve into the story, listen carefully to the words, because those words are introducing us to something that is coming on planet Earth. So let's see how the story reads. Genesis 18 is a review, verse 20. And the Lord said, speaking to Abram or Abraham, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. And their sin is exceedingly grave. So here, God is telling Abraham the condition of Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice verse 21. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, what's really important here is that God is not going to act until He gets a first-hand report, a first-hand accounting. In other words, some people think that God just sits up there and sends down a lightning bolt. That is not what Genesis is telling us. It is telling us that God has to come down and walk and see and hear and know what is going on. In this case, he has two angel messengers that you will meet here in just a moment, okay? So...
Verse 1 of chapter 19, Now two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Now, it is really interesting here because in several instances in the book of Genesis, Abraham and Lot recognize these particular men as being significant and worthy of being bowed down. And, and this is about putting your forehead in the dust of the earth. So, isn't that just fascinating, the insight of Lot and Abraham? Pay careful attention to that as we develop the story. Now, notice verse 2. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. What is Lot saying? It's really best if you just come right now to my house, come on in, let me fix you dinner, and then leave first thing tomorrow morning. This is telling us that Lot is aware of the corruption in the city of Sodom. But notice how they respond. They said, however, no, we shall spend the night in the square. They wanted to publicly experience the city of Sodom. Remember, I said they want a first-hand experience. Now notice verse 3 of chapter 19. Yet he urged them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread and they ate. In other words, he put out a wonderful spread. They had a wonderful meal. Isn't it good to know that angels can look like us, act like us, and eat with us? Many have entertained angels unaware. And that's one of these really great moments for Lot. In verse 4, before they lay down, in other words, they were ready to call it a day and everybody was going to go to bed, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, notice the text now carefully, surrounded the house Pay attention, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. Now, this is really significant because when I talk about corporate judgment, I want you to notice that the text clearly says that everybody in town shows up at Lot's house. Men, women, children, they are all there with expectations. In other words, they've seen this before, and their expectation, well, what they're about to do is not the first time the people of the city have turned out in mass to experience this. It says in verse 4, both young and old, all the people. Now, this is an important illustration of sharing in corporate sin. Everyone's participating. But please keep in mind, it is a micro story of the final judgment on earth or of the earth. In other words, when we look at the judgment of God, those who may be saved and those who will be lost, I want you to notice in Sodom the corporate participation in evil so that you understand that what comes later in this story is the justice and the fair judgment of God. It says in verse 5, they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Now, this is the New American Standard Version, which is a very literal translation. The text clearly says that the men who are demanding these angels to come out clearly want to have sexual assault. They want to assault them. And who's there? Who is the audience? Who are the participants? Everyone from every quarter of the city. There is no one here innocent. Did you notice that? You need to be paying careful attention to that. Because this is about sexual violence. 
But there's more to that than just sexual violence. If you're listening and if you are paying attention. Verse 6. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him. And he said, please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now, Lot certainly does not want to participate in this. He certainly calls it wickedness. He calls it for exactly what it is. Men wanting to assault men, acting wickedly. There's no question about that in Scripture. There's no argument there. Verse 8. Notice this carefully. Please do not miss this. He says, Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with a man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like, only do nothing to these men in as much as they have come under the shelter of my roof. Now, you could say that's really offensive because why is he sending his daughters out there? Well, I'm going to say two things. One, I'd like to assume that he really felt these men would not want to assault his daughters. That probably would have already happened because they live in the city already. And they really wanted men wanting men. And so offering the daughters might have been a fairly reasonable thing for Lot to understand exactly what he was doing. On the other hand, maybe he put the welfare of these two godly men, these messengers of God, if you would, these angel messengers, maybe he was willing to sacrifice to protect them because he knew what was coming. But they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien, that's Lot they're referring to, and already he's acting like a judge by calling them wicked. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. They were going to break into the house take Lot and the men who came to visit him. So you can see the violence is building here. The tension is incredibly intense in this story. But the two men inside, the angels, reached out their hands, brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. Now you say, why do you call them angels? Well, listen carefully. They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness. Only angels can do that. Both small and great. So they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Now that is a divine intervention. That's a divine action by these two men. Saved everyone in that house, as you can see in this story very clearly. Then the two men said to Lot, whom else do you have here? A son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city. Bring them out of this place. You understand the warning here. The angels are saying to Lot, whoever you know, whoever is family, whoever you have a connection to, get them out of here now. This is urgent language. Do it now. Verse 13 for we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. It's going to be quite an event, isn't it? This is a solemn moment for Lot, for his daughters, for his wife in that household. Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law who were to marry his daughters, his sons-in-law, and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law as being jesting, joking. And here Lot is pleading with them, How often do you talk to someone you care about? You tell them how important it is to know the Lord, and they just brush you off. This reveals the condition of the city of Sodom as it surely will reveal the attitude of man at the end of time. 
they'll just think religion is a joke or the judgment of God is something that's humorous. Verse 15. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Take up your wife, your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. Now, please pay attention to this carefully. This is urgent. This is not a casual conversation. Like, go ahead and pack your things and let's go for a trip. It is not that kind of a story. But notice Lot. He hesitated. Did you hear that? Please note. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife, the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. In other words, they had to literally take hold of him and march him out the gate of the city. Because Lot, it just still has not registered the urgency of the hour. Now, I'm just going to say this. I think there's a huge amount of Christians in this world today who are oblivious to the urgency of the hour of the Lord's return. And Lot becomes this profound illustration as a man willing to hesitate on the eve of destruction. They had to be drug out of the city. Did you catch that? It's a profoundly important story. Verse 17. When they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life! Do not look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. Flee to the mountains. It's the only place that's safe. Now, I hope you assume that Lot just said, Come on, family, let's head to the mountains, right? Well, there's more to the story. But Lot said to them, Oh, no. My lords, wait a minute. The city's going to be destroyed. Get to the mountains. It's the only place that's safe. And Lot says, no. Verse 18 is a fairly short verse. You cannot miss that. No, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. He continues, you have magnified your loving kindness, which you've shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for disaster will overtake me and I will die. Wait a minute. Didn't they just say, Lot, if you flee to the mountains, you will not die? Did you catch that? It's like, Lot, you're just a little slow to catch on the urgency of the hour. But can I be so bold to ask you about the urgency of the hour for you personally? Do you have a sense of urgency for the hour in which we live. As we're watching violence spread throughout the world right now, in the Middle East, in Israel right now, well over a thousand people and more are dying while we are talking as war has been declared. Would you have gone and run out to the mountains? Or would you say, oh, you know, we're pretty safe. We're outside the city now. We're okay. What would be your attitude in this story? It might be the same attitude you have today. Verse 20. Now behold, this town is near, Lot continues, enough to flee to, and it's small. Please let me escape there. Is it not small that my life may be saved? Now, process that for just a moment. The judgment is going to fall on Sodom, Gomorrah, and the people in this valley. And, and Lot made the choice to go to a city in the first place and look at the consequences. He said to them, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town which you have spoken Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there, the angel says. 
Therefore, the name of the town was called Zoar. These angels must have been a little bit frustrated. Makes me wonder how frustrated they might be today with you and me. It says the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor. So again, Lot chooses a city rather than the safety of the mountains. In Matthew 24, notice what Jesus said. The same thing these angel messengers said. Jesus said, those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. It's the same message. There is a time when that is where safety lies, when the judgment of God falls. But Lot chose rather a city which turned out to be not safe at all. That's a challenging story for us, isn't it? A profoundly important story. Now the details. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. You know, there's a explorer and geologist here just a few years back went to a location where they believe Sodom and Gomorrah once may have stood in. Do you know they found brimstone? They found craters. They found everything of what was one time a city in which there's burnt rock and brimstone in which that city was completely leveled and there's absolutely no left evidence of civilization to this day. Verse 25. It says, He overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. So we're talking about this participation in corporate sin, or a corporate judgment. There were no innocent people here. What was happening in Sodom and in Gomorrah, and the people in this valley, was that they had all became part of this corruption of violence. So who was making the cry? Well, I would assume that it would be the children, those who maybe had run for their lives. Maybe they were even being hunted like Lot was at the door of his own home. Maybe it was those who were suffering in the, in the cycle of abuse, then joined the abusers. But that suffering of humanity, God is hearing even to this day, on this planet, those who are suffering injustice and violence and sexual assault. And God has a heart to bring about a judgment to eradicate that evil, not just from this earth, but from our universe. The question for you and me, are we listening to what God is trying to tell us. It says in verse 26, but his wife, that's Lot's wife, coming up behind him as they're headed out to Zoar, paused, turned around, and she looked back and uh, turned into what appears to be a pillar of salt. Now, some scholars would say that it is very possible that Lot's wife may have had relatives in Sodom and Gomorrah, that she may have grown up there, she may have had uh, attachments deep in her heart. But where was her heart? Was it escaping the judgment of God? Her longing to look back revealed the truth of her heart. Looking back shows she was comfortable with their lifestyle. Maybe she didn't approve, but she was comfortable with their lifestyle of assault and violence. We become immune to things in our culture, don't we? We learn to look the other way. We learn not to get involved in other people's lives. Where's our heart? Where is our heart? I want you to know that Lot living there, 
willing to call sin by its name wickedness, that Lot probably had spoken against the other issues in that community. And Lot may have been giving the last warning to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. But Lot probably wasn't the only one because God would not act until every person in that city had had an opportunity to turn their hearts away from the violence and the corruption they were living and participating in. Because that's who God is. But I want you to remember Lot's wife because she looked back. Genesis 19, 27, now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward the land of the valley, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. All evidence of that violence was completely eradicated. That removal of sin from that valley was Permanent. It was gone. Corporate punishment. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. I hope you think about it. If you choose to live in cities... I would strongly encourage you to consider moving to the country, if you could. We're living in a state of decline. You see, this illustrates the corruption, perversion, and the violence that is likely similar to the human violence listed just before the flood. It also has important implication as we near the end of time, just before Christ returns, to redeem those who live by faith alone. It is important for you to know, would I stay or would I go? This is an intense story, isn't it, today? God is calling us out of cities. He's calling us to himself. I want to go to our closing picture of these two beautiful swans. You know, these rice paddies, uh, after they've been harvested, are just filled with simply tens of thousands of birds. And these beautiful swans are just out there having the best day. All kinds of good things to eat. Thank you, Sherry, for what you bring us in this lovely story. I hope it refreshes your mind a little bit. But I want you to ponder this story and go back and read it again. It is speaking to us today. A relevant truth. Hope you come back next week. We have another intense presentation. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.